Welcome to Open Source Sustainability. I'm Alex Lassiter, CEO of Green Places. On this show, I talk with sustainability leaders to learn how companies are adapting their business models to be in line with sustainability goals. We believe sustainability has to be open source to be successful, and these leaders have offered us a glimpse inside their strategies in the hopes that we can all move forward together. We are fascinated by some of the unique challenges these sustainability leaders face and are excited to dive deeper. Today, I'm joined with Pamela Cohn from Amity Advisory. Pamela is a leading expert in the field of sustainability and environmental, social, and governments, or ESG practices. With a vast experience serving on the board of the law firm Sustainability Network and a background in actuarial consulting, Pamela has been at the forefront of helping law firms and other professional services businesses navigate the evolving landscape of sustainability and ESG. I'm excited to talk with her about why law firms need to prioritize sustainability and the changing expectations of clients and recruits. Hi, Pam. Welcome to Open Source Sustainability Podcast. We are so excited to have you. Um, thank you for, for taking the time to chat today. It's, it's very much my pleasure, Alex. Thank you for inviting me. Well, to start off with, you have, uh, you're running and started the law firm Sustainability Network. So let's start there. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and tell us about the law firm Sustainability Network and what y'all do? Yes. And just to clarify, I didn't actually start Law Firm Sustainability Network. That credit okay. goes to Gayathu Joshi, um, who okay. served as the executive director for decades. But I am serving on the board for Law Firm Sustainability Network, and I have for quite a while. Um, first of all, in my role at Milliman, which isn't a law firm, but is a global actuarial consulting firm, and we were just embarking on our sustainability journey. So I reached out to LFSN as a way to, to learn more and then got invited to serve on the board. And I've been serving on the board since. In my role at Milliman, I switched from chief marketing officer to social impact and sustainability officer in large part because clients were starting to ask us very pointed questions about what we were doing around all elements of ESG and sustainability. And so I moved into that role and served in that role for about five or six years. At the same time, I was building a practice called Amity Advisory that would focus on law firms because I knew the same sort of client pressure or supply chain requirements, however you want to look at it, was going to be hitting law firms as well. So now I'm full-time Amity Advisory, helping law firms and other service firms be responsive and proactive when it comes to ESG. So so why would a, because you don't think about, when you think about sustainability, we think about Patagonia, Nike, Allbirds. We, a lot of times we think about physical products, but I don't think it's as common for, for the general public, I think, to think about a professional service, you know, like a law firm, for example. So can you talk to us a little bit about why are professional services companies and, and legal services companies needing to to think about sustainability and ESG? Why is that something that they're that's even on their radar today? It's funny you should say that the general public doesn't think about law firms or, or the professions as, as needing to focus on ESG because many law lawyers don't realize that they need to focus <laughs> on ESG. But here's why. If any of the law firm clients are committed to net zero, a big part of getting there is making sure their vendors and suppliers are on that journey as well right? You can't get to net zero without managing your scope three, which is vendors and suppliers. And so even if law firms footprint is minuscule compared to manufacturers or retailers or travel companies, the way it works is greenhouse gas emissions is a percentage reduction. So it doesn't matter where you're starting from, the greenhouse gas emissions protocol expects all entities to reduce by a certain percentage. So when a client company, and many, many companies have made net zero commitments, when a client company makes that commitment, part of that journey is including their vendors and suppliers. And if they go by spend, law firms are a big part of a company's spend. I see. Often. So law firms are included in that. And what's interesting is when clients send requests to their law firms for greenhouse gas emissions data, many law firms don't even know what GHG stands for, let alone have they been tracking data by office, by location, 
et cetera. So it's a big task for law firms to start doing this. But yes, it, you know, everybody has to do their fair share. So even law firms and accounting firms and other service providers have to be responsive to client and stakeholder requests. So when a company makes a net zero claim and they say, we're going net zero, they're now reaching out to their suppliers, and in this case, their law firms and professional services firms saying, I need you to report into me. Do they need them to, is it a, is it an optional thing? Is it a, we, we're doing this or we're sending you to RFP? Like, how is this kind of perceived in the stack of, of priorities and, and urgency that you're seeing? I think every company is different. And I would guess that for many companies, what their outside law firms do is probably of much less focus than their the companies that are supplying their raw materials, for instance, because that obviously is a much bigger sector of their greenhouse gas emissions. But I think many companies expect all of their vendors and suppliers to be with them in spirit and to make the commitments and the steps forward to make sure they're moving in the right direction, even if it is only a small component of their entire greenhouse gas emissions. Um, I, I know of one situation where a client ended a relationship with a professional services firm. Wow. And it wasn't just for the sustainability question, but it was basically your commitment to ESG is insufficient to meet the expectations we have of all of our valued vendors. Thank you very much. And it was a big client. I do know of a number of client organizations, companies who have set goals and targets for their law firms. So for instance, many companies are using Ecovadis to assess their supply chain. And there are companies who said, we expect all of our vendors and suppliers to get to a certain score within X number of years. They usually give a runway. They usually understand that it's a journey, um, but they certainly expect to see progress year on year. That's really interesting. So I saw a report recently that said something like 80 to 90%, I think it was 87% of law firms have reported that they've seen RFPs that have specifically asked questions related to ESG. Um, which is really prevalent. That's 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 a lot. Have you noticed this change? Is it becoming more? Is it was it always that case right out of the gate? Or are you seeing this as an increasing pressure? It's definitely increasing. Um, it definitely plays a role in the evaluation. I mean, certainly you have to have the expertise and you have to have the right billing structure and so forth. But if it comes down to two or three firms all of whom meet those previous criteria, it could very well be a deciding factor, right? I don't think it's the the factor for choosing, but it, it could be a deciding factor for eliminating if it's not there. Um, and that's in the RFP stage. What I'm seeing more and more is what we were just talking about, the annual evaluation or assessment of current vendors and suppliers. So even once you've got the job, you're still going to be um, asked to demonstrate progress in ESG um, in order to maintain that relationship. So and those it, it, questions it feels, are much more rigorous than the RFP questions. That feels like compliance. It, mm -hmm. it feels like similar to years ago when we, we started to get into personal identifying information and GDPR yes. and the way we think about our own you know data. This feels like Comply it feels like a compliance issue. And it if very you much don't do this, you clients, can lose. Right? It yeah. very much is for the clients because the clients who are publicly listed or meet certain thresholds for for ESG or carbon disclosures, their supply chain has has to contribute to those numbers because that's part of their scope three. Now we don't yet have those regs here in the US. I expect they'll be coming this fall, but they exist in the EU and the UK. And any law firm that is doing, even a US-based law firm, if you're doing significant level of business in either the EU or the UK, these regs apply to you as well, even though most law firms are privately held here in the US. In fact, I think all of them are. But yeah, they apply to you if you, if you um, reach certain revenue thresholds or 
um, your clients need that information for their own disclosures. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting. It's funny because it reminds me of this idea of supply chain risk reminds mm -hmm. me of, uh, of, of, of when Nike had the issues around um, child labor, the sweatshops back in the, I guess it was in the 90s, I think. And I remember the headline, and I was being pretty young at the time, but I remember the headline being, you know, Nike is, 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 this is a catastrophic incident to maybe the world's most valuable brand. And I remember thinking there's no possibility that anyone could ever think anything less of Nike. It's cool. It's everybody wears it. It's, it's associated with all these really good things, but they take that stuff so seriously. And I think about, you know, if this is an extension of that, if you're Microsoft or a bank or, you know, a fortune 1000 or, or whatever it is, even a public entity to, to perceive it from that perspective, if people aren't in line, it poses such a threat to my own brand risk yes. that it's almost not worth the, con it's not even worth the work at this point. And, and, and that's, that is, that is scary. I mean, that is, that's a, I understand why somebody would, would treat it with that way. Are you seeing law firms treat it with that level of urgency? Do they understand that in the large part? Well, I think they initially are beginning to understand it when it comes to recruiting because the up and coming generations, the, the fresh law school grads are paying attention to how committed is the law firm to all ESG elements, not just sustainability, but certainly um, DE&I and governance practices and so forth. So I think they recognize that this is a lever for recruiting. Where it will go next, I suspect, is decisions about what type of work the law firm takes on because students and employees, um, recruits, care about that as well. So, for instance, there's a difference. Now, I'm not a proponent of, you know, no longer doing work for oil and gas companies. I don't think that's going to get us where we need to be. But I think it's important what type of work are you doing for those oil and gas clients? For example, if I'm helping those oil and gas clients transition to green energy and make commitments to evolve from fossil fuels to whatever comes next, that's really good work. If on the other hand, I am representing off, uh, fossil fuel companies in Congress lobbying against carbon regulations, that, you know, uh, will not be looked on so favorably by the upcoming generations and frankly, society at large. So I think law firms are at the point where they have to start making decisions. I think especially those law firms who have historically done a lot of work for fossil, the fossil fuel industry, they have to look at it as what are we going to do when this revenue stream dries up and goes away, right? So what can we do to help that sector of our client base evolve and continue to thrive. Even the CEO of British Petroleum or BP said, I don't want to be the CEO of a company where nobody's buying the product in 10 years. So what do we have to do now to be viable 10 years from now? And that's what law firms should be focusing on in helping their clients with this transition or transformation, as some people are calling it. Well, what's good about that is that's an opportunity. Right. Absolutely. I mean, I think about that, that that's a very pragmatic way to view this from BP's perspective. And they're right. They, yeah. they, 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 they want, they don't want to work themselves out of, out of, out of the industry. They want to be able to continue to thrive and yeah. evolve just like every other business has done over the last, you know, hundred years. And thinking about it that way doesn't, to me, doesn't frame this as, hey, we can't do this anymore. We can't take on this business to more, hey, this is the type of business we should be taking on. And this is the good work that should be done. Yes. And yes. I was on a, a conversation recently with um, a person who oversees you know, ESG and sustainability at the, the stock exchange. And he said something to me that really struck me that I think is one of the reasons that I, maybe it reminds me of what you're talking about, which is we just live in this world where everyone's going to find out everything. Yeah. We just, we, it's, it's just, it's just too easy. There's, 
everyone, there's a million reporters, there's everyone's got an iPhone, everyone can take pictures, everyone can see things. You've got anything that you want, anything that could be seen will be seen. So if there's anything that you're doing, like you said, if you're defending the wrong case and the wrong side of things, or maybe you're taking stances that you ought not to, you have to be know, you have to know that that's going to be available to the public. And you want to be able to say, look, we made these decisions for this reasons. And this is why, because we believe in it. And like you said, it doesn't mean you can't defend people or work with certain clients, but it does mean that people are going to ask that question. You know, people are going to, I remember maybe two years ago, they, they said that with advertising agencies. I remember there was a, there was a list of, here are the people that ran these campaigns for 10 years, you know, in Congress. And this is where the lobbying money goes and people know. Now people know. So what do you do next? You can't, we aren't going to be able to go back to a world where people won't know information. Yep. And so now right. people and have think, a decision. I think transparency is huge to your point. Mm -hmm. And I also think that all companies, including law firms, have to make decisions about what type of work is it okay for them to do and what type of work they will not do. And that's a hard decision for law firms to make. I do know of a professional services firm that has made the decision that they will no longer take on work that is contrary to achieving the Paris Climate Accord. So in other wow. words, they're not going to take on work if the result of that work is going to hinder progress towards Paris, um, the Paris Climate Accord. So that's a big decision. That's a that it is. And for a partnership in particular, when you work within a partnership, um, getting to those sorts of decisions is really hard. So taking a big step back, because there's there's definitely businesses that especially law firms that I feel like have polarized. You've got folks on one side that are just really doing this. I mean, they're, they're full two feet in pushed in that direction, but then there's this reality of everyone else, which is, you know, firms that are, you know, they're, they're not, it's not good versus evil. They're trying to run a business. They're trying to be successful. They're trying to be a great place to work, all these types of things for those folks that are getting this pressure, both from upcoming recruits, but also from their vendors and who might be thinking, okay, we need to do something. We can't be perfect, but we need to get on board because I don't want to lose a deal. I don't want to lose a client and I don't want to lose a recruit because of something that we could solve. What do they need to be doing? What is like step one for people here? Like, what are they, what is like the beginnings of this look like to say, Hey, we're going to, we're going to be on board and we're going to, we're going to at least not lose the deal for this, right. you know? The, the very first thing I often recommend for particularly law firm clients is to take an inventory of what's already happening, because most often in law firms, stuff happens in silos and the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing. So if you do uh, in, an inventory and you figure out what's already happening throughout your footprint, throughout your offices, you you, you find out that 99% of your offices are already using LED lightning light already composting and they're already recycling and they're paperless. You know, you'll find out things on the sustainability side. You will also find out things on what are we doing to support our communities in all of our locations. And often, simply because the culture of the firm permeates decisions that people make, you will discover themes like, look, 78% of our offices support educating children in their communities. And I'm just making this up, but you'll discover themes if you take an inventory. Um, so, so at a minimum, if you have your arms around the current state, you can be responsive to client questions at least, right? So that's right. the baseline. The other thing I recommend firms do is, well, two things. One is do a materiality assessment. What's important to your stakeholders? What's important to our clients? What's important to our employees? What's important to recruits? What's important to the vendors and suppliers we work with? Because that will also help define what you prioritize. Because you can't do everything, right? It's, it's Everything is going to have resource costs associated with it, and it's a trade-off. Um, and then the third thing I recommend law firms do if they haven't yet done it is to take the EcoVadis assessment. You don't have to wait for a client to ask you to take the EcoVadis assessment. You can go on the platform, register, and it's a nominal fee. Take the assessment because what you get back from that assessment is your overall score and 
going to score in four pillars, environmental, labor and human rights, ethics, and procurement practices. Once you get a score in each of those pillars, you also get, here are the things you can do to improve your score. So it's basically a roadmap of what you should do over the next 12 months so that a year from now when we do a reassessment, because the score is only good for 12 months, you will have made steps to improve your score. And there are many, many clients now who are using EcoVadis to manage their vendors and suppliers. So if you've already taken the EcoVadis assessment, when your client asks, you can say, oh yeah, we did that and here's our score and here's what we're doing to improve. So that's absolutely something you can do to prepare because it's coming. If you haven't yet been asked by a client to do EcoVadis, it's just a matter of time. So you might as well do it proactively. It's really interesting that the uh, recurring theme in this podcast is is getting started is a lot less scary than people I think sometimes believe it to be. It's, and especially, I'm sorry to interrupt, but especially no. because no firm is starting from zero. They just don't realize it. So so you have to get a handle over on what's happening and then you'll realize that hey, we're not starting from ground zero. We're already doing some really great things. How can we build on that? How can we structure a narrative around that so that we have a cohesive holistic story to tell that every firm can do that and that's interesting because i think a lot of people have this anxiety and and we hear this from folks which is i'm worried we're going to score poorly mm -hmm. and it's okay mm -hmm. first of all you you don't know where you are because mm -hmm. you haven't done anything you might find that you've done a bunch of amazing things and you have plenty of things to be proud of you might find that you do have some problem areas and everyone's got problem areas. Yep. So now you know where to focus. Yep. The anxiety a lot of times, especially from you know a partnership or an executive level is not knowing. We all want to know. Yes. So go take an assessment, go get a, a, an, an inventory, figure out where you are, and then you can make a decision about what's important to you and how you're and what's important to your clients and customers and how you can improve. That's exactly right. And I think you're spot on when you say, and this is particularly true of law firms, they don't want to do the assessment because they're afraid their score yeah. isn't going to be stellar. And I yeah. can guarantee you that the first time you take EcoVadis, your score will not be stellar. Hands down, no questions asked. And that's really hard for law firms, right? Lawyers have been A students their whole life. So to suddenly get a score of 28 out of 100, that's very upsetting to them. And it's hard, it's hard to make progress. I can give you an example. When I was at Milliman, the first time we did EcoVadis, our score was 28. Five years later, after five years of really hard work, our score was 48. So it is not easy to get yeah. a stellar score on EcoVadis, but, if you can show progress year on year, your clients will know that you're on the journey, you're focused, you're making progress, you're, you're moving in the right direction rather than the status quo. So I, you know, I encourage firms to be transparent about their EcoVadis journey and their ESG progress overall, but you're right, it is really hard for them to be willing to be transparent about those things. When it's one of those things where I think uh, did not participate is probably worse than mm -hmm. a low score. Mm -hmm. You want to, by saying did not participate, you're immediately disqualified. You, you lose, I, I have this conversation with my six-year-old all the time, which is if you don't participate, you automatically lose. At least give yourself a chance to potentially get there. If you don't enter the race, you can't possibly win. You've taken every win off the table. And, and, and that's, that's true, but that is hard. It, it's hard for high achievers. Every law firm I've ever met. It's like the smartest people I've ever met. And it is hard to do that, especially when you've, these are companies that are built on brand reputation. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and that, that reputation is, it takes a long time to build and it takes an instant to lose. And you are as good as their last 12 months in that business. And that's about it. It is fickle. And it's important. And that's what partnerships do is they build that up over time. I can imagine the, yeah. I empathize with that. I understand that's difficult. Yeah. And I guess the only good thing is that the clients who are asking you to fill out EcoVadis understand because they're using EcoVadis, they know how hard it is to get a stellar score on EcoVadis, especially right out of the, right out of the shoot. 
the other assessment that is really hard to score well on is the CDP, the Carbon Disclosure Project. Right. Um, and there you get an F if you don't participate. <laughs> And so you immediately if, lose. You immediately lose. <laughs> if you do participate but don't do very well, you get a D minus. But it's still better okay. than an F. Um, yeah. And again, the first time Milliman did CDP, we got a D minus. But then it it was obvious to us what we had to do to get better. And the last time I checked, Milliman score was a C. And wow. because they just set net zero targets and have been SBTI certified, I just know that the next time they take the CDP um, assessment, it's going to be probably a B plus or a B or above. So to me, that shows that that particular firm is on the journey towards improvement. Yes, we started at a D minus, but look how far we've come. That's such a great way to put it because progress in, in, in every way that I've ever seen it is always better than perfection. Yeah. yeah, That's the goal. The goal is to just start, take an inventory, get where you are and begin. That is what your clients are expecting you to do. And you raise a good point. Anybody that's asking you this stuff understands it. Yes. And yeah. they know, and, and, and we know what their answer will be. If you just don't participate, <laughs> yeah. they're not going to be happy with that. Yes. And I also think that anyone who is in this business or working with their vendors and suppliers frequently will use the word journey. Like this mm -hmm. is a journey. It is not mm -hmm. a project that will end mm -hmm. someday. Right. Mm -hmm. I had, I had a lawyer <laughs> ask me, this is when I was in marketing in a law firm. The lawyer asked me, when are we going to be done with our website? And the answer is you are never done. You are never finished with a website, right? It changes yeah. on a daily basis. And so we will never be finished with an ESG journey or a sustainability journey. It is a process, not a project. And I think anybody who's in this space, including your clients who are asking law firms to, to engage, they know this is a journey. It's not a one time done, you know, one and done sort of thing. So getting that message across to the partnership at law firms is sometimes a challenge because they see things in black and white. They want an A, you know, the first time they do an assessment, it's not going to happen. Well, and that, that's one of the things where when, when the conversations that we have with law firms is this idea of if it's a project, it's something we can tackle this year. Is, but is that it? Is the request going to stop? Is the need to keep doing this going to stop? Are we going to complete this one day? And you're right. It becomes an operating challenge. Right. It becomes part of how you do things. And the lens that we take a lot of times is these aren't in oper these aren't in opposition to running your business well being more sustainable having better esg metrics actually aligns with running your business in a way that's going to make you more successful you'll hire better you'll win more deals sometimes you'll spend less money like you'll stop doing things just because you've always done them and you'll reassess which is part of the way that businesses have become more efficient and more productive you know over the last 200 years we constantly look at ourselves and we say let's look at our balance sheet and let's assess do we need that expense or do we not yep do we have overlapping services when we enter a recessionary period and i'm in the tech world it is it moves from a it moves to a world of tech consolidation you start to go to your tech providers and say hey could we save money by you also doing this and that's a constantly evolving thing because the business is operating and there's always better ways to do it. And this is opening businesses up to a lot of things they haven't done before, but that's good. Right. Cause it turns a light on a lot of things you can improve. Who, who typically owns this at a law firm? Who are the, who are the people that are having these conversations and running these programs? Well, that's a very good question because in a law firm, ESG has, there's two sides of the coin. One is, ESG advisory services so that the lawyers can help their clients with these projects or this process. And then there's what is the law firm itself doing? So often in a law firm, the advisory practice will be head, headed by a lawyer who's the, you know, the practice chair for ESG. Um, and they're focused on helping clients. 
on the operational side, it is often coming from the CEO or the COO when I get questions. Um, because they're the ones who are trying to figure out how does this fit into our overall priorities, our overall budget and so forth. And I also get questions from clients, law firm clients about, well, if we were to hire somebody, where should they sit within a law firm? Is this a legal function? Is it an HR function? Is it a finance function? Is it a Marcom, marketing communications function? And my response is be really careful where you slot this person. Because if you put it in marketing communications internally, it sends the unintended message that this is just a PR ploy, right? If you put it in legal internally, there's the unintended message that, oh, this is just compliance, right? This is just a check the box thing. If you put it in finance, then all of a sudden it's just reporting. You know, it's part of our annual reporting that we have to do. If you put it in HR, People assume it's just DEI. You know, it's just that diversity initiative we're working on. So, what I find, what I have experienced that works best is that the person not be in any of those departments, but on par with all of those officers, so that he or she can influence things that are happening in each of those siloed departments and have a direct reporting structure to whomever is running the show, whether it's a COO or a CEO. And that allows for the proper infiltration of ESG so that it is not perceived as somebody's job over here and I can just keep doing things the way I've always done things. But how does ESG permeate the way we run our business from a strategic perspective? So it's a very interesting question you raise. That is really interesting. And I think a lot of, as businesses start this path towards a coming to terms with having to do it and B figuring out how they're going to do it. That is a question we get a lot and it's right. It's not, we always say it is, it's not a vertical function. It's horizontal one. Yep. Yep. Which is one of the reasons why it's absolutely so difficult to hire somebody for that because you've got to find somebody who's savvy enough at each one of those things to make an argument that says we should do X and it's going to help marketing in this way. It's going to help finance in this way. It's going to satisfy procurement in this way. And that is a very challenging thing. Not many people have that skill set. And not many of those also are in the world of ESG sustainability. That's a very strategically difficult job. Yes. Yes, it is. And especially if you're coming in cold to the company, you don't have any relationships. I think one mm -hmm. of the things that worked to my advantage at Milliman when I moved into this role, number one is they sent me back to graduate school so I could get well-versed in social impact and sustainability. But having been there for 15 years as CMO, I had really deep, meaningful relationships with all the other corporate officers. I knew how to get things done. I knew who the partners were. I knew what the priorities were for the firm. And frankly, in the short time that I was there as social impact and sustainability, I feel like because of that, I was able to get a lot more done than if I had come in cold to the position and had tried to figure out all of that while also implementing ESG. That would have been an incredible challenge. So I often talk to my law firm clients about who internally is passionate about this, is already known and loved by the partners and vice versa, who understands the culture of this firm, because it is much easier to send that person to ESG school or you know, <laughs> whatever education program you want and have them implement than to bring somebody in cold who then has to also learn the culture of your firm. So don't, don't rule out internal people um, when yeah. you're looking to fill this role. Well, to me, that's a pretty exciting thing because there are a number of people that we've met through the years at firms who do have a strong passion for this and they've been running grassroots green teams, you know, trash pickups and small things over the last 20 years. And now they get a chance to actually build a career out of it and potentially get the executive approval to do so, which is really exciting. Yep. And and I think a, a, a great thing. And I agree with you. I think being able to promote from within, especially on something like this, because sustainability ESG is very, very specific to every business. Yes. No business is the same. And until you understand all those nuances, it's hard. Um, so what is, what is some of the work that you do at Amity and, and how have you helped businesses and professional services law firms get there? 
what is a typical kind of engagement typically look like? Well, some of it I've already described because often law firms will engage me to provide some baseline education, help them conduct the inventory, which we talked about, run a materiality assessment, talk to stakeholders, do the focus groups, and then as a result of that, lay out what we discovered and what the best next steps will be in 12 months and 24 months. So my work usually takes about six to eight months, that um, description that I just provided, and then I provide a roadmap for the next 12, the next 24 months. Often, I will also help law firms and frankly, other clients, because other clients are, are now coming to me for Ecovadas support. Um, I recently trained as an Ecovadas consultant, so now I can help companies go through the Ecovadas assessment. Um, and often when I'm working with law firms, that's part of the package is to get them through their first Ecovadas assessment. And then also, you know, other companies come to me for just that, just help me with, with the Ecovadas assessment. Because as I mentioned earlier, taking the Ecovadas assessment will give you a roadmap of what to do next. So that's probably the least expensive way to get started. You don't even need to hire a consultant to do that. You can just take the Ecovadas assessment and you'll get a list of things you should do <laughs> with, with no that's great. hesitation. Is there something that you wish, like what is one thing that you wish that every law firm knew about this, but didn't? Like, is there something that you wish you could tell everybody and say, look, if you just knew this, like, what would it be? Well, and this isn't the first time I've said this. People who know me will know that I preach this all the time. Law firms have been really quick to jump on the potential revenue around DSG. Like, let's position, let's package our team so we can say we have an ESG team to help clients. And I think that's great. That's This is the biggest opportunity of our generation, frankly, as far as I'm concerned. They should be doing that. But if you do that without also making sure your firm is on the journey, it's a, only a matter of time before a prospective client is going to say to you, oh, really, you want to help me with my ESG? Tell me what you're doing for your firm. Where are you on the journey? What is your uh -huh. Ecovadis score? What are your commitments to net zero? And if the lawyer goes, bah, 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 mm, we haven't started that yet. It's just your mm -hmm. credibility goes out the door. So they should not be separate. Part of advising clients is experiencing what your own firm is going through and changes your own firm is making in order because then you can say, well, here's what we did, or here's what we found worked, or here's what isn't working for us, right? That gives you a whole level of credibility, plus your firm will be making progress as well. So if you feel qualified to, to promote yourself as ESG advisors to your clients, you should also be advising your own firm and taking that those same recommendations. And what a great way to empathize and understand their journey better yep. than to, to be doing and drinking your own Kool-Aid yep. and doing it yourself. It's like the that cobbler's makes... children not having shoes, right? If you're out there um, advising clients on ESG, but ignoring it as your own firm, it's not a good yep. look. Yeah. Yeah. That makes little sense. Well, Pam, this has been a super, super great conversation. I sincerely appreciate you taking so much time to talk to us. Thank you so much for taking an hour and discussing what you're doing. I think it's super exciting. I think uh, I, I think this is something that I'm energized that law firms and professional services are coming to terms with, but I'm very optimistic and I know that there's a lot that we have to do, but I'm excited to know that they've got folks that can help them like yourself and networks like the Law Firm Sustainability Network to be able to get some community in this and get some, some group help on that as well. But thank you very much for your time today. Thank you. It was my pleasure, Alex. Keep up the good work. Thank you to Pamela for joining us and thank you for listening. If you like the show, please be sure to leave us a review and follow this podcast wherever you like to listen so you don't miss an episode. This podcast is powered by Green Places. If you're looking to reduce your company's environmental impact and reach your sustainability goals, visit greenplaces.com to learn more. I'm Alex Lassiter, and I'll talk with you next time on Open Source Sustainability.